was my bad. So it uh, it, We're live. it brings out the SJW and everybody, huh? <laughs> and I'm sure you look brilliant in a burka anyway, but I just mean, saying. quite a quite a social experiment. Hey, we're live, everyone. Hey, how does that feel to be in a, in in that flowing kind of robe walking around? Do you wear anything under it? It, I, it kind it's of feels nude. nice. Totally nude, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> hey, Bear, are you? Uh, I saw. I get a. I got an echo there. So, you good? Uh, that was me with my laptop on. It's off now. Okay. Yeah, how's my sound? Okay. Everybody sounds good. Hey, I'm going to hit record and start the podcast because every every minute is precious with the great Kelly Brogan here. So let's do it. We didn't do our normal uh, checks and everything with Mike because we're caught up in the pre-chat session here. Chatty, chatty. <clears throat> okay, boom, let's do it. And boom, we're back with for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winter, and I'm here, as always, with Dr. Bear Paul Lando, coming to you live and direct from the beautiful azure waters of the Smith River, up here in the great state of Jefferson, where freedom still reigns supreme. Love living here. Um, the people are amazing. Um, I guess the mask mandates were uh, officially taken off the books this week, Bear, even though I didn't even notice because people don't even care anyways. But I guess the one benefit is uh, our lovely uh, folks working at Wild River Market got to take their masks off finally. So that was cool to see yesterday when I went in there. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's funny how um, it, up here, most people just don't care. And that's why we love it. So uh, we have the great Kelly Brogan today on the show. I want to get right into it. Um, Anarchapoco's going this week. Uh, if you guys weren't able to catch our talk uh, last night, uh, they will be doing replays. I think they're having some technical difficulties uh, with the stream, but you do definitely want to try to catch that because we went deep into the um, alchemy of the bioterrain. And Bear and I are going to be doing probably what, Bear, one of these a month as we dive into these different yeah. elements um, uh, because there's just so much to cover. So uh, very excited. And we'll do the one we did it in Arcapulco, only we'll go deeper because we had to cram it into an hour and we couldn't even finish it all. So we'll expand it into our typical six hour format. Yeah, and it is uh, it is a an, my favorite topic right now, Bear. Just it, this is why we started AlphaCast is get this info out of your head and get it out to the world. So uh, very you don't very want exciting. what's in my head. <laughs> Too late. Um, <laughs> today, Kelly Brogan joins us. Uh, AlphaCast friend Kelly Brogan, MD, returns, and to say we have uh, much to catch up on would be a major understatement. <laughs> uh, Kelly has continued her fearless activism for the cause of freedom and drawn the ire of institutionalized control in the process. Quote, own your body, free your mind. Ain't that the truth? Uh, Kelly is a holistic psychiatrist and best-selling author with psychiatric training and uh, fellowship at uh, NYU Medical Center after graduating from Cornell University Medical College uh, and has a BS from MIT in systems neuroscience. Wow, Kelly, such scientism there. Uh, Kelly brings rare insight into the world of current events with the heartfelt wisdom and courage to speak the truth during these tumultuous times. In Kelly's own words, the truth is what only you can get is the only thing that can get you well. We all need time to validate our suffering, but then we need to step into a place of self-empowerment. We share Kelly's observation of, quote, spiritual-based influencers that have opted for conformity at the expense of sovereignty that Kelly has aptly termed spiritual bypass. We'll dive into a little bit of that today, hopefully. Uh, but truth is indeed the antidote to the prevailing collective psychosis and it is incumbent on each who choose a similar path to freedom. Uh, I'm excited about this rant round table today, Bear. How are you this fine morning? I'm doing great. And uh, Kelly, thank you so much for making time for us today. This is always like old home week talking with you here. So <laughs> it's always fun. And, um, you know, I want to jump right into it because we want to hear your insights about what's going on right now. And I, you know, when I sent out the mailer yesterday, I, I put the collective psychosis and um, that's, uh, you know, really what intrigues me because uh, the, the polarization is so complete now with the, the two camps of people. And uh, despite the fact that there's so much information out now that 
just basically unravels every part of the narrative and the treachery behind the control grid. So it's it's all out there. There's no more secrets, but still some people choose to um, opt for that. And I, I understand there's a whole control mechanism, a mind control mechanism, which is very sophisticated. I get that. But I suspect, and you're uh, uh, much more versed in explaining what's going on in the individual psyche, uh, there's much more going on than just mind control. So it's also filling a need, I think you'll be able to explain, and individuals that still want to stay within that realm. And, uh, you know, I have to admit to something, Kelly, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, you are, of course, distinguished by making uh, that uh, group, what do we call it, the Dirty Dozen. And so uh, I don't believe I was even considered for it. So uh, I was took that very personally. What am I doing wrong here? So anyway, Kelly, thanks for being with us and, um, and uh, take it away, I suppose. Total pleasure. I think you didn't put your mascara on when the when the right adolescent <laughs> uh, bloggers were obsessing about uh, the dirty dozen yeah, victims. So funny. It really has that feeling of like these boys in the playground, like pulling my braids. It does not have the menacing feeling of uh, big, bad authority figures coming down on me. And that and that, you know, is a, is a segue to what you're describing, because there is a lens, certainly, you know, through historical documentation of trauma-based mind control and efforts on the part of um, governmental agencies to control and influence the population through these very strategically laid out uh, emotionally driven agendas. There's, you know, there's a perspective that says they are doing this to us and we are uh, being victimized and it's not fair and it's wrong and uh, it's time for us to fight back. And that perspective um, really falls short, I think, of, of my truth anyway, which is that there is an opportunity here. And it's an opportunity to recognize the way that your particular puzzle piece fits with the puzzle piece of these so-called controllers and their intentions. And you know, when this all started, um, I'm sure it's true for, for you both, you know we smelled what was up, right? I mean, if, if, if you've been questioning germ theory already uh, at the inception of this pandemic, then when it came on the scene, you knew that there was something behind it, right? And there is a geopolitical, um, you know, effort that was, the button was pushed on it, right? And when this started, I, I, I you know, took off running and felt it was my obligation to sound the alarm. And I did that obsessively, really like lost sleep, trying to understand what was going on and all the dimensions and all the characters and uh, ran my, my mouth and got picked up by mainstream media back in like March of 2020, whatever it was. And, and then I got to a point like not too long thereafter where I recognized that either you see you know, the story behind the story, you can, you can perceive it, uh, or you simply are so much in your limbic that you're not in a position to take in information, uh, or this information would be, even if you were calm, cool, and collected, so threatening to the infrastructure of your reality that it's not my business or really anyone else's, whether or not it works for you to take it in, right? Like what would the implications of taking it in be? That's every person's individual um, journey. And so at that point, a couple months in, I turned toward, okay, you know, if I'm pointing a finger out there at those totalitarians, at those, you know, tyrants, at those fascists, um, at these characters who are being puppeted by, you know, the deep state controllers, if I'm pointing a finger out there, what can I control? And so, you know, I took, I took a long, hard look at my behavior and at my life, um, because of this concept of the mirror of judgment, right? That which I condemn, typically I am embodying, even sometimes in the condemning uh, gesture itself. And, you know, you don't have to look farther than somebody who's demanding that you put a mask on for, you know, the health and well being of the collective and this like, this vitriol, this hostility that is, you know, spicing their words, you feel, wow, this isn't about love of humans, right? What else is going on behind the scenes? So, you know, at that point, I, 
I restructured my business and I stepped down as CEO. I looked at, um, you know, the ways in which I was still, I've always run a, a fairly libertarian household as a mother. And I uh, never really have had rules for my kids in the classical sense, never punished my kids ever. Um, and I sort of found like little comments I would make like, oh, you know, you should really like clean, clean your room, right? Or please just try this salad or whatever, just in, insinuating that I know better how they should manage, you know, my kids are not babies, okay, how they should manage their exper experience of embodiment than they do. And I just sort of, you know, went through these different instances where I was um, asserting my will over any other or invoking hierarchical energies. Um, I closed my private practice because I felt like I couldn't get out from under uh, my MD. I still use it. I still play with it. I still invoke the energy of it, right? From time to time um, when I feel it serves the, you know, the mission, so to speak. And no matter how much the nature of my practice was to hand the baton to my patients, and I would say the longest anyone was really uh, typically a patient would be like one to two years tops coming off of many, many meds, et cetera. I still felt like there was a, a codependency, right? Like an outsourcing to me, a, a sense that I know better. And I knew that that wasn't true because at that point I had a, you know, a decade of experience watching women ignite their inner uh, fire and follow it home, right? I was just there saying, you've got this. That's literally all I was doing. So, you know, from that point, it got even more uncomfortable because then I said, okay, well, you know, this is behavioral stuff. This is my lifestyle um, that I can take a look at. I started, you know, raising chickens. I started gardening. I, you know, um, got off my smartphone. I, you know, started really engaging the, the, like the walk of a, uh, a so-called sovereign individual. And where I didn't want to look, you know, was the emotional dimension. Right. And I'm, you know, in the business of emotions. So if it was hard for me, I imagine that it's probably pretty, pretty intimidating for most. And I did not want to look um, at the relationships in my life um, that I was playing out victim dynamics uh, and keeping myself in a vibration of suffering and an experience of disempowerment that ultimately, of course, I was responsible for. And that's when I became very interested in this concept of self-betrayal and the role that I feel this very simple phrase, word, um, plays in everything that's going on right now and how we are enculturated from childhood to believe that the only way we can secure safety, belonging, approval, and love is by caretaking another's experience and by abandoning our own needs and wants in service of that connection. And it sounds like, oh, okay, do I do that? I don't really do that. I do my own thing. Well, I bet if you look at any of the pain points, not you personally, Bear, I know you're enlightened. Mike, maybe you. If you look at any of the pain points um, in your life, right, any of the conflicts, in your real life, I'm not talking about like the anonymous victim that us activists love to campaign for. I mean, like the real hurts in your real interpersonal um, landscape, you will probably find a way in which you have participated in your own, you know, imprisonment in a dynamic that is not fulfilling you. Maybe that can't, right? And you have not fully gotten real about that. You have not acknowledged, right? So maybe this is a relationship with a sibling or with your parents or with your partner or with a friend where you, you keep going back. Um, you know, it's like a saying like to get eggs from the hardware store, you keep insisting that something be procured from this source that is literally probably not available, but you've never asked for it directly anyway, to even find out that it isn't. Right. And so you have this need, right? Like, let's say your, your mom is like super volatile, right? And she, she has, 
you know, what is dubbed in this, uh, you know, the, the psychological arenas. Um, she, she's an emotionally immature person, right? She's just never developed um, the kind of emotional tools that would be required for her to take personal responsibility for her behavior, for her to offer empathy. And so you really walk on eggshells around her and she flies off the handle anytime you disagree with her, anytime you do something that you know, she doesn't like, and it's this like, you know, this dance that you engage and, you know, she, um, talks about herself all the time, right. You could say to her, Hey mom, listen, like, you know, the next time we talk on the phone, I'd really love for you to like, listen to me. Cause I want to, I want to share some stuff about my life and, and, and I'm happy to hear about what's going on with you, but it's really important to me that this be like balanced or whatever just for example, right? And if she's like, how dare you? You're so selfish. I always knew all you cared about was you and whatever. If that's what you get, then you have confirmation that she is not able to provide you what it is that you need. And then you have this human superpower, which is called choice, right? Where you can decide what works for you. How does this relationship work for you? How can you negotiate your respective needs to make it work for both of you? And that might mean that you need space. It might mean you, you don't have a relationship. This is exactly what's happening on the meta scale, right? And again, I know, you know, Barry, you've been in this, this world for decades, right? Asking from <laughs> government, um, asking from the me? medical system. <laughs> it's true, right? Like you, you've known this for so long, yeah. like you can't get it from there. Stop asking. Well, right. One of the one of the perks of aging is that you know you kind of adopt this attitude. Some of us that I gave it the office, so you just can't give it anymore. And uh, but then ironically, you realize if you would have adopted that attitude earlier, you wouldn't have aged yourself in the first place. But uh, no, I wear my uh, I wear my scars of aging as a badge of honor. But sorry to interrupt. Go. Ahead. I mean, to me, it's just awareness. You know that that. Mm -hmm you've been holding this energy field of, of the sovereign impulse for longer than the rest of us who've been on, you know, on the scene, moving through the necessary righteous anger, the necessary indignation. Why is it necessary? In my opinion, from my perspective, it's necessary because the anger, okay, like it's a much um, safer emotion than the grief that could feels like it could suck your entire soul down a drain. The grief of the, the, the final acceptance that you will not get the love from your parents that you wanted. That's literally what's at stake when we walk away from these systems and we finally say, damn, I can't get it from there. Now what? Now I'm in the wilderness, naked and alone, right? And on, on a wired level from our infancy, that is literally the existential equivalent of the death knell, okay? That's how big a deal it is to turn away from the, you know, the surrogate hit of safety that these systems and the associated communities and societal structures have to offer. Right. So to expect somebody to see what's happening, expect them not only to see and then fight it and be angry and how dare the government and all the protesting. And, and listen, you, everyone needs to do them. Right. You do you. If that's your lane, I am grateful, um, you know, that you've found what your expression requires at this point. Uh, however, there is a point at which many of us, I think, get to the place where we can release some of the anger at the bad daddy and the bad mommy, we can move into that, that almost like annihilation space of the, the chrysalis, right? And just say like, I'm gonna relinquish my identity, right? As an angry activist, I'll speak for myself. Um, so then what am I? I, I? I haven't built the new system, right? Yeah, like I don't have that to offer either yet. Um, so now I'm just in this in-between where what was isn't working. I finally see that, but I don't know what will be. And that, you know, uh, that, that, that liminal space is necessarily uncomfortable. So I always used to tell my patients as they went through, you know, this dark night, 
to just allow the confusion, allow it to be, it is temporary. And if you just give it space and oxygen and you, you swim in that sort of like, who the hell am I? What am I doing? Like, it's really a, a child trauma space of like, I have lost everything I need. And I've often observed that it's only when you lose something that you think you're going to die without, right? The relationship with your sibling, your, the approval of your parent, um, your relationship to your psychiatrist and your beloved family doctor, when you're ostracized from your church or your community or whatever, when you lose something that you think you can't live without, there is a rebirth. And that rebirth is the expansion that is allowed to um, take place because the confines, not only of your old story psychologically about who it is that you were, um, the confines of that emotional bracing, right? To not feel the bad feeling. And, you know, the, the, the confines literally of a nervous system that says, I can't handle joy. I can't handle peace. I don't have any capacity to hold all of the sensation, right? All of that begins to fall away in this transmutation process. And then you literally can be reborn into the person, of course, you've always been, right? That's like the, the paradox. So pretty radical to uh, approach somebody who's fighting hard to maintain the controls in their life to just walk up and pull the rug out from under them all, all together. You know, I don't remember anything in my upbringing or my institutionalized uh, learning that prepared me for any of this. Right. And, uh, you know, I can't imagine people right now that need to go through all the emotional accommodations I made over decades. And now they're being asked to do it in a matter of months and weeks, uh, you know, uh, more severe than just cramming the night before an exam. Uh, yeah. So I, I hear everything you're saying and, and absolutely explains a lot. So uh, then the other thing is that um, I think some of us also have to let go of maybe trying to save individuals that are, just really requiring that kind of experience in the first place. So um, how do we go uh, ahead with, uh, you know, maintaining that heart space and um, empathy without being sympathetic for the folks that are maybe going to make some uh, decisions that aren't necessarily good for themselves their health or even their spiritual evolution? I mean, I think that's why I've, you know, I've taken a little, um, what is this slack from slack? <laughs> Whatever the hell the phrase is. I've taken some of that, um, for promoting individualism, right. And, and my very deeply rooted belief, I know you, you both agree with, which is that we can't possibly create a beautiful holobiont, right. Of beingness. We can't possibly draw the mandala of our, you know, oneness and our unity field until we have a good sense of who the hell each of us is, right? And, and this is like the Jungian individuation process that self-discovery is the primary impulse of the human soul, right? Of the human spirit. And that is literally what you came here for, that until you have deep self-awareness, you can't possibly love another because you don't love yet yourself. So the template is not here for what it is to embrace and hold all that is. You're still in rejection of parts of yourself and you will experience that of course on the outside as well. In fact, you will project those parts of yourself that you are either not aware of, um, have repressed or disavowed and you will fight with them on the outside and you you know, this is why in so-called spiritual communities, we're seeing so much condemnation and judgment of those who are not conforming um, to the here's how you be a good person uh, list of behaviors, including, you know, getting vaccinated for the herd and wearing, you know, a, a mask. But this um, individual impulse, this sense of I have to get to know and own what it is that I want and need. And I can also appease this other part of me that says, you're bad when you do that. You're selfish, right? 
I can appease that part and the part that holds these needs sacrosanct by communicating what it is that I need with compassion and understanding that it is absolutely no one's nobody owes me a damn thing. Your kids don't owe you anything. My parents don't owe me anything. My lover doesn't owe me any, nobody owes me anything. Right. And so if that's the, the true sovereign nature of this, this realm, then I can't possibly be attached to anyone changing because of my needs and expectations and desires. They have their own process and their own journey. Right. But it's through that, um, rescuer role, right? The Karpman triangle of the, the victim, which is, you know, whenever you're in the no fair, poor me, how is this happening? Like, you know, this is just horrible rejection of reality, energy field. You're in your victim, of course. But then that same consciousness, which I've said, I believe is the only human pathology. And, and it's really the, the great um, impulse behind what we call evil is victim consciousness. That same consciousness hides. It hides in the villain, right? Who believes that they're entitled to aggressive retaliation, punishment, and recourse because they also feel wronged, right? So whoever is the bad guy also feels right about how they've been wronged or why they're entitled to take what they are taking. But the sneakiest one and the one that I think we all can relate to or should develop some awareness of is the rescuer, right? So the rescuer is um, still a victim, right? That rescuer feels victimized by whoever is the villain, right? So let's say we're trying to, you know, save the world from, you know, the, the, the crown and <laughs> the gates and the Fauci's and, you know, all the rest, Um we are in our victim consciousness, perceiving a greater power that has the potential to harm us without our permission. Um, and we are colluding with the victim story of the victim, reifying the fact that they believe is, is the case, um, which is that they couldn't possibly save themselves without our very unique and specific aid, right? So that reification, like sometimes I give the example, right? Like um, if my girlfriend can't pay her rent, historically, because I am a world-class rescuer, um, that's where my victim has often hidden. Um, historically, I might just like wire her money to help her out, right? And why would I really do that? Well, cause I'm nice, of course, and I'm a generous woman, right? And I love her, so that's what you do. Well, there's a secret um, motive and that's what you'll find those in, in a lot of spiritual communities are unwilling to look at secret motives. What could be a hidden motive? I think that's the most important question you can ask yourself anytime you feel like you're doing something good. And it doesn't make, mean that that secret motive is wrong. It's just better understanding why you do things is a very liberating practice, right? So a secret motive might be that if I don't do it, she'll think I'm cold or mercenary. Or if I don't do it, she'll think, you know, that I'm, I'm not actually a nice person and she might know that I have the money to do it. And that's even worse, right? So I might experience myself as not a good person, right? So I don't want to feel that. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do it. It might also be the case that I can't really tolerate the discomfort of her situation when she <laughs> talks about how hard it is. You know, this is why, honestly, I became a doctor. I literally think this is why I became a doctor because I had this little tolerance for anyone's discomfort, you know? And when I worked a suicide hotline at MIT, I was in the deep end of, of experiencing others' um, deep discomfort, right? And, and their, their angst and their distress. And it was so intolerable, literally to my nervous system that I had to find a solution immediately for them. And typically that was shuttling them along, you know, to the, the kindly uh, psychiatrists at the mental health center, at the, you know, the student mental health center. So that intolerance for another's discomfort, that, that inability to hold space while they just feel scared without yeah. having to fix well, it. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I relate to everything you're saying. I, I think there's uh, quite a few of us that chose a vocation in the healing arts because we are that caretaking archetype. And, uh, you, you know, my wife, Deb, has helped me, <laughs> coached me over the years with that one, just saying, Bear, you can't save everybody, you know, so it's uh, no, I, I hear everything you're saying. I see that, too, with the first responder scene that I'm in with the, the fire department. And there's like this, it, it is interesting because we see ourselves as heroes or, and, and, and of course the, the system has set us up the first responders, you know, the, they're the ones that are there at the first of the line. Um, however, we're, they're also the pawns that are being used to propagate the system, right. To keep it going. And it, it's a tr really tricky thing. And there's different levels to this Kelly, obviously. And I'd rather be that archetype where you're at least helping in, in helping versus so much taking, but it's interesting. We we're talking about the law before we went on. And really the law is built on two things. It's the creditor and the debtor, right? And really what we're talking about here is being the creditor and not the debtor. Yes. Because, and when we can start to understand how that works and how simple reality plays out in that sense, we can then really understand what sovereignty means. And all of that goes away when we become the creditor. And Bear is really good at explaining that much better than I, but it's, it's a very simple thing once we step out of all of this narrative and all the stories and all the archetypes. And I would and how also- How about an emergency? Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, how about an emergency medicine? I did that for a while. And uh, you, you know, you're on a scene and you have to triage, which literally means you have to pick which ones you're going to work on knowing that the ones you don't work on are probably going to die. Uh, yeah, tough call, tough call. So sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, absolutely. I was just going to say that, you know, this invokes some pretty big questions, like mm -hmm. metaphysical questions about the benevolent nature, right, of the universe of, of a human being, right? Because, right, if you want to help, Mike, you do that. You do that. And you'll find out if the impulse is to help because it feels good to Mike to help. If someone doesn't appreciate what you're doing, <laughs> that's always what I say. You'll find out if you're just doing it because it feels good when there's ingratitude on the other end of your, you know, um, investment in doing the right, doing the right thing. And that's enculturated because, you know, when, when little Billy gives a blueberry to Sally and he's four, because it feels good to share because humans are fundamentally benevolent. They are love-based beings, right? When he does that and Billy's mommy says, that was very nice that you did that, Billy. Good job sharing. Well, now- Here's a Billy, lollipop. Right, here's a lollipop. Now Billy is gonna give a blueberry next time because mommy liked it and because he secured mommy's approval. There ain't nothing more powerful than that. So he is disconnected from the native impulse towards, you know, compassionate expression, um, towards this, you know, sort of philanthropic uh, web that we would otherwise exist. And he's disconnected from that. And now he's externalized his motivations in a very natural and understandable way, because securing mommy's approval is way more important than doing anything because it feels good. Yep. Yeah, you could say the Christ came in because that was to reify the whole notion of service, service for the purpose of doing service um, as the universal laws um, uh, require. And, um, you know, Christ, obviously, during the stations of the cross that I was, I actually played Jesus in eighth grade and went through the whole thing with getting whipped and getting... <laughs> getting uh, nailed to the cross and it felt really weird as so the, did you have your beard in the eighth grade too <laughs> i had wisps i had wisps oh. here. but like You're they sad. picked me because i was the skinny dramatic kid and uh and so but it, there was a really weird feeling as in the audience watching that as you know i went through these stations um as people were engaging in this you know victimhood and of course, Christ didn't, if, you, if you, you believe the stories of the Bible, he, of course, didn't play into the victimhood, right? He was doing this to um, show that service is of service no matter what, no matter how hardcore 
of the whipping and lashing you're getting, you're not doing it because it feels good. You're doing it because it's just the pure service of, of Christ consciousness or whatever you want to call it. And so that's why I try to serve as a fire in the fire department, even though sometimes I hate going on calls. Um, but it is tough, Kelly, because it does also feel good. Uh, and I, I tell myself, hey, I, I got to go do some good right now. So um, it's a really weird interplay between the um, physiological response you get out of it and then the higher notions of what that consciousness is supposed to be in terms of this like universal law of the giving nature of, of, of what our consciousness is supposed to be doing. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's just been essential to reframe altruism, right? As fundamentally something that is still self-serving. And to reframe self-serving as a neutral phenomenon, right? It's only because we've been socially enculturated around this idea that self-serving is bad. And of course, all of us know how that has uh, been operationalized in, in many psyops, but, but specifically infectious disease related ones or greater good, common good ones. Uh, this idea of, of being aware of your your impulse to do what works for you, to do what feels good to you, even if what you're doing is in service of your feeling good about being a good person, right? Like you can unpack all of that if you just recognize, even when you're doing something selfless, you're doing it because it feels good to you to do that. It's even masochism, right? That's the nature of masochism is it's pleasurable, right? So you're doing it because it feels good. That does not make it bad. And it may just introduce you to more options, uh, more ways to meet that need than are otherwise apparent when you're not aware of why you're doing something and you think you're simply doing it for another. You know, this caretaking impulse goes really deep and it, it hides uh, behind a lot of what otherwise looks like you know, do-gooding <laughs> behaviors um, that are without strings. And I think the more we can own it, like, wouldn't it feel better to live in a world where you can trust that everybody is doing exactly what works for them and you don't have to mind read and you don't have to guess whether you're going to be punished, you know, the moment that you don't do what they want you to do, because we all understand you're going to do what works for you. I'm going to do what works for me. And if this whole thing with between us works great, if not enjoy your journey, right? That is what emotional sovereignty is. However, there's so many layers to unpack. I mean, I was at this event this weekend, past weekend, where we were tasked to go out in, you know, in, in the community, in the city, um, and do these kind of like weird things, right? Like, you know, just start like giving a sermon in the middle of a supermarket or like rolling around <laughs> on the floor laughing or, you know, like ask a stranger to dance. And it was one of the harder things I have done, to be honest. I mean, it literally, if like I had been asked to take over the programming of the event <laughs> or like speak to a couple thousand people, I would have been completely fine with that. This was very hard for me. <laughs> Why was it so hard for me and my big mouth and, you know, all of my experience giving, you know, zero fucks about what anybody thinks? Why is it so hard all of a sudden, Kelly? Okay. It's hard because I have a deeply ingrained caretaking impulse that says I have to make sure other people understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then I can do it. Once they understand what I'm doing, once I manage their reality, once I um, am in charge of the merger of our spaces such that they, you know, they can see what I'm doing. They may not approve of it, uh, but they can at least see what I'm doing and potentially why then I can be okay. But this idea that like people have no idea why I'm doing this, what I'm doing, and it makes them uncomfortable. It it was extremely challenging. And that is, you know, dubbed like enmeshment trauma in like the psychobabble world, um, which is this idea that I can only feel safe if I am merged with the reality of another to such an extent that we're sharing a reality. And that doesn't work anymore. 
I mean, we literally are not sharing reality. I mean, the three of us are doing a decent job, but odds are even we are, right? There's no reason to assume that you're sharing a reality with even your, your partner any longer, right? You have to constantly um, give room for somebody to have a completely different experience. There is consent involved in entering in. You know, that's why when I've been on, I was in, on this interview and they were like, well, I just want to understand how, you know, if, if, if someone was immunocompromised and because all villains talk like this, if someone was immunocompromised, <laughs> like, why would it harm you so much to just like put a mask on? What's the big deal? Right. And I was like, hold on a minute. Like, we're not, I have not consented to your reality. I don't live in that reality. Bingo. Where the basic premise of what you are discussing as a moral imperative is even relevant to me, right? So until we are consensually engaged reality to reality, and I can offer understanding of, of how I see yours and you offer me understanding of, of mine, there's no meeting of needs. That's a more advanced conversation, right? We have to first acknowledge one another. That's a place to start. Uh, that, that's so amazingly right on. And, you know, with, um, it, I think just understanding universal mechanics, you know, it's, it's a give, give universe. And when you mirror those mechanics, then when you are giving you with that, I think also comes discernment as far as, um, you know, if you're giving is even <laughs> doing anything, you know, that you think it's doing in the first place. Uh, and very often, I think in the human realm, we end up enabling more than giving. Totally. But, uh, you know, a, a patient care also, you know, helped me understand that because it became very visceral to me. Uh, as I was, you know, doing my thing, uh, e either it, 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 created more buoyancy and vitality in me or else it just felt like a train and that's all I needed to know. And then, you know, that's when I'd end up, you know, maybe firing a client or something to say, I don't think I can help you anymore. But um, I, I think it really is that simple, but because we've got so much of this baggage that you're, you know, very well articulating, we just can't even feel the obvious anymore. That's why I am, a huge believer in a kind of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, like at this mm -hmm. like orders, mm -hmm. order of operations. Like I am a big believer that first you start with the, the chopping wood and carrying water of lifestyle change. You know, you get your diet in order, whatever that means for you. Um, you look, you bring consciousness to like literally the products, the, the detergent you're washing your clothes with, you know, the water that you're drinking, what time are you going to bed? And you, you make a practice of experiencing the power of your choice in this material secular realm. And you, you begin to resolve a lot of that white noise of the body's rightful messaging of how you are living wrongfully. And then you can start to, you know, uh, look at all of the, the secret places that you've not wanted to look, you know, there was this, uh, I went on this um, silent retreat with this teacher, Adya Shanti, and um, he asked this question that I, I still ask all the time um, of myself and of others, which is, you know, what is it that you know that you deeply wish that you didn't know? <laughs> about yourself or about, about yourself? Right? Mm -hmm. you got it. Do you got about an hour? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it's like, ooh, it's like, ah, I shouldn't be eating that shit or I got to leave my partner or I'm really like not doing my best as a mother or like mm -hmm. that patient's got to go or whatever it is, like there will be a, like a little hit, right? And once you allow yourself to bear witness to the ways in which you've been hiding from yourself, you can't unsee it. And then when you're ready, and the readiness is like this very, um, it's like ephemeral, you know, it's like who, who knows what readiness consists of? Well, I know that the courageous things I've done in my life, which have nothing to do with my public persona, by the way, that have everything to do with my relationships in my life, the, the courageous thing that I, things that I've done, the conversations that I've had, 
you know, the, the things I've been willing to lose um, walking into the wild unknown. I have not been ready to do that even one second before I was ready. And if somebody told me like, you know, you should really sit down with your mom. It's been a while or whatever. I would have been like dug in with resistance. Right. So readiness, it comes to you like a, like a, a whisper, you know, that you're, you're ready to, to, to hear finally. And so that is the next stage that becomes so much more available when your nervous system has been sent a signal of safety through your lifestyle choices. And then you can, you know, go on your spiritual walkabout and begin collecting the parts of your soul that were left on the side of the road, you know, from, from your probably even childbirth, let alone um, your, your childhood, you know, and, and this, this, process um it has all of the elements of an archetypal journey of a hero or heroine's journey truly home to yourself but until you have that foundation under your feet like i don't even know how somebody could be expected to be engaging um this psycho spiritual and emotional work because you your nervous system can't it can't hold it you literally will think you're going to die from the fear, from the, you know, the shame, from the rage, I mean, from the grief, it's literally not something we have been trained, you know, with those eyes we would wake up to in a different, you know, tribal setting that gaze upon us when we are feeling self-doubt and say, no, you've got this. We have not been trained. We've been trained by our parents who say, stop feeling that. Stop crying, calm down don't do that. You know, it's just this, this divorce from the self, this sense of warfare uh, within that, that we're charged with healing when we're ready to take these steps. So can you help us extrapolate this into um, our attachment to illness concepts? And, um, uh, you know, in the pre-internet era, I used to do a little public speaking here and there, and I there'd always be one person in the audience that would take it very personally when I get into concepts of new German medicine or germs aren't creating this, or, and they felt that they're being personally attacked, and you know now that they're being blamed because they're sick, and how can you be so callous? So um, yeah, here we go again, huh? Absolutely. And that's uh, I mean, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, I think you know it starts with. Uh, with uh, Descartes, right, where where the the sort of mind body split and and this concept I mm-hmm. haven't started before then, but this this idea that the the spirit is without, right, and here is just this like dirty flesh suit that you have to manage into submission, right, and and mm-hmm. these have nothing to do with each other, and denominational religions really um, you know crystallize this concept of separation between flesh and spirit. And then, of course, allopathic medicine was primed um, to be the, you know, the, the machinists managing the machine, right? The doctor priests um, coming in to take care of your car that is so susceptible to breakdown. That's just what it does. And don't take it personally. This has nothing to do with you as an individual. And there's so little you can control. And of course, that's gene-based medicine and everything else. So embedded in um, that, whether it was intentional or not, could be debated, but embedded in that is the foundational premise of victim consciousness that, of course, is essential. Without victim consciousness, we cannot be controlled. We can never be controlled because all we know is meaning. All we know is, you know, the, the sovereign impulse. All we know is that you have total responsibility for your experience. You narrate what is for your life. Right. So victim consciousness is essential for these psychological operations. And in the allopathic model, you know, you have the rescuer who's the rescuer. The rescuer is the goodly doctor. Right. Or the nurse or whatever it is, Um, the, you know, the official of the system there to rescue you. You are the victim having this horrible experience that just kind of happened to you because of your bad genes or your bad timing or your random bad luck, but who's the villain? Your body, (laughs) your body's the villain, right? So because of that enculturated separation, it's very easy to turn towards our scary bodies, having this scary experience 
bringing us into realms of pain and mortality that we have only ever postured against, right? That's what we're here to fight is death and, and discomfort, right? We don't have this sense that it there is an initiatory experience of our own um, fear or our own brush with our limitations, so-called, you know, um, death, near death experiences, if you will, that can expand us. Like that's not even in the, the rubric. So we are fighting with inclusion with the system against our very own bodies. Um, and of course this includes in the realm of psychiatry, it, it includes your emotions, right? Your thoughts mm -hmm. um, and that warfare it gives you this experience of being right about being wronged. It gives you an experience of relative empowerment when you feel nothing but uh, terrified and disempowered. And it offers you importantly, an identity, right? An identity to fuse with and to feel um, that you have some mastery over because it is this, fusion with the small self in neglect of this higher self and neglect of this bigger universal self, divine self, that is essential for us to be moved around like, you know, chess pieces on the board. If you connect to that, you know, I'm not just Kelly, the psychiatrist. I'm not just Kelly, the good mother. I'm not just certainly not Kelly, the wife. I'm not those things. I'm also this. And I'm also that. And one day I might be this. And what if I'm also selfish, manipulative liar and cheater? Am I still me? Yep. Still <laughs> me, you know? So this sense of like more fluidity with identity, identity plasticity comes with a maturation of, um, you know, your, your psycho-spiritual dimensions that can only, I think, be afforded through initiation. When you see, oh, I thought I was that. I thought I was going to die. And look, I didn't, right? When you let something go, when you move through the fire. So I think we cannot take from people their identity as a patient. I saw that. I, I'm sure you have too. I saw that in my practice. When we would near the end of our time together, and my goal was always that my patients would literally never see an MD again, you know, in the conventional sense, actually, um, but maybe even at all, there was a resistance that would come up. And that's part of why I, you know, recognize the limitations of the dyad, right? Of the doctor, patient, master, student kind of hierarchical model, because the resistance was really, you know, around, well, but if I'm not this, what am I? And there's something that we get out of our victim story, or we wouldn't have it. So what are you getting out of being a patient? Well, I know many of my patients would say, you know, they got, a, you know, a get out of jail free card. You know, they, there was so much they didn't have to embrace or engage in life. There were so many ways that they could play small, play broken, um, and really inhabit this sick archetype that served them until it didn't. You know, that's why I'm not somebody, for example, who necessarily demonizes substances. I wrote a very controversial blog years ago on alcohol um, <laughs> that was not appreciated by the, you know, AA community. And I understand why, because if you don't believe that the problem is outside and you believe that this substance or whatever it is, is actually doing its part, it's actually serving, it's actually maybe even necessary you approve of that dynamic and you don't make the dynamic the problem because it's necessary until it isn't. And when it's not, honestly, it just goes like any relationship that's expired um, because of a, a meeting of needs that wasn't available in a more uh, direct way previous to that moment. So, you know, that's why like, no, we're not here to emancipate people from the medical system. They need it. They need it until they don't. And when they don't need it, yeah, then we can be here to say, you got this. You were born for this. You absolutely heal yourself. Yeah. And we might want to rethink having a mantra that's, I am an alcoholic. I, you know, that's, uh, there's a lot going on there. So, uh, uh -huh. you know, my, in every first patient visit, the first thing I tell everybody is that, well, Number one, you have to know you don't need me. <laughs> you never did. And the goal of our therapy is to get you to that understanding. 
But, um, you know, another thing I'd really like to get into today is, uh, you know, we've taken care of the caretaker archetype. What about the spiritual guru archetype? Uh, Because I know personally three very renowned spiritual influencers, and they are strongly admonishing their disciples into conformity these last couple of years. Uh, So maybe you could take us in through that journey. Yeah, yeah. So I was not, I don't know, were you surprised? Like I, I was not surprised to see that there is barely, uh, you know, a spiritual talking head out there who is not shilling, you know, for pharma right now, uh, or for the mm-hmm. agenda. I don't, I, I mean, I, maybe we can together come up with like one or two, um, for the most part, they've all capitulated. And, and to me, that's not shocking. And Um, Part of the reason is because in years past, I started to see a lot of prominent and new, um, some prominent, you know, spiritual talking heads who were promoting antidepressants and psychotropics. And I remember initially feeling so confused by that, right? Like, isn't the, the, the native impulse of the spiritual quest to say yes to what is, right? Isn't it to, to fundamentally love and accept that which is before you as um, a poetic reflection of all that you can't possibly see within and to really work with, you know, um, all of these little things thrown on your path to strengthen your faith um, in the benevolence of the universe. Like why would it ever be okay or condoned, let's say, to fundamentally reject an experience of bad feelings, right? An experience of symptoms that make you feel out of control, an experience of symptoms that are painful or difficult. Why would that ever be consistent with uh, spiritual practice? And you know, I wrote something I called an open letter to the spiritual community and ultimately wrote my last book for the spiritual community. I literally wrote Own Yourself for people who call themselves spiritual, right? The yoga teachers, the Kundalini community, the whatever um, it might be who are in that Cartesian split where they're all about, you know, um, attuning to the transcendence of the divine in neglect, rejection, and otherwise, you know, (laughs) abandonment of their physical body, right? What happened to the physical body that it is not an expression of the soul? And what happened is that we're a couple hundred years into this conditioning that the body is a machine and the spirit is outside. And then you couple that, you know, just maybe it's just ignorance, right? So I thought, okay, well, maybe if I just bring to the attention as my rescuer, right? It's my job to bring to the attention of these folks that there's more to the story of symptoms. They are messages from the soul. And there's way more to the story um, about you know, pharmaceuticals and, and allopathic interventions, there's a spiritual dimension. I mean, just look at, if I am opening an orange prescription bottle with my name on it every single day, what is the spiritual messaging I am offering myself? I am reifying this idea of myself as broken, as insufficient, as, you know, powerless, I'm not doing that on purpose, but it's literally a, a subliminal, you know, sort of spell casting every single day that happens. How can you possibly feel like the creator of your own universal experience, you know, of, of what is, how can you possibly feel that way? If you're also in the belief field that says you are totally, not only powerless, you are powerless over the only thing you should be able to have any agency around, which is yourself, right? You don't got that. Something outside has that power. And of course, you know, that's why this idea of the new age movement being itself a controlled opposition, or I learned this word a couple of years ago, a recuperation um, event, you know, just like midwifery or naturopathy or homeopathy or the Waldorf school system and all of the ways that they were offered a cozy spot, you know, in um, the, the playground of the, you know, Rockefeller institutions and allopathic entities so that they could fundamentally be, cho- you know, under a chokehold of control when push came to, to shove. 
and it's not forced. That's the creepy part. They are participating. I, you know, we know chiropractors and naturopaths and, you know, midwives who are absolutely voluntarily um, in their energy of Stockholm syndrome, defending the aggressor, shaming those who would otherwise imagine that it is, you know, inconsistent with the impulse of these ancient practices and traditional fields of supporting the body's, you know, vitalistic um, intelligence, it would be inconsistent to coerce, uh, you know, germ theory based interventions. I mean, you can feel like the, the, the divisive energy. And so, you know, I think that coupled with the fact that why do people turn to spiritual practice? They turn to spiritual practice because they feel like shit. They feel bad. They're struggling. They're in pain. I don't know too many people who've turned to spiritual practice out of like the goodness of their heart and wanting to give back to society or whatever that so-called altruistic impulse is. And so if we turn to, you know, I know I turned to Kundalini yoga, for example, and, and meditation and sadhana practice because of a dark night of the soul, because I was in so much pain that I thought there's got to be a way to feel less of this pain. Oh, maybe this 26 minute Kriya will do it. Right. So it's the same impulse that would have me reach for a bourbon in my opinion. Um, and so through that lens, these folks don't have a lot of experience with the shadow. They don't have a lot of experience with what they would deem negative emotion. And anytime the bad is simply bad, there is no possibility for true spiritual integration. And if integration is the point of spirituality, then what are we even doing here? This is like a clown car. I mean, what is happening? This has nothing to do with spirituality. If there is such a thing, and I'm not invoking moral relativism to say, oh, you know, you want to molest children and that's your, you know, your thing, you do that. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm simply saying that when there is judgment, blame, and condemnation of a dimension of the human experience such that it is to be avoided, that is, you know, what Wellwood called spiritual bypass. That is a utilitarian, you know, um, engagement of so-called spiritual practice and spiritual ideas so that you do not have to look at your deeper motives and so that you do not have to have any intimate contact with your inner badness and your inner wrongness. And that's why the sooner you can get comfortable, and it is the hardest work, the sooner you can get comfortable with somebody you care about seeing you as bad or wrong, you're free, right? But most of us are still controlled by the avoidance of how decimating it would be to feel that. And so these spiritualists are saying, this is bad. To die is bad. What's up with that? I mean, I thought this was the flesh suit that you incarnated in, you know, for this, you know, lifetime. Why would it be such a bad thing to merge back with the, you know, the unity fields? <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So dying is bad. Dying is bad. Sickness is bad. Not doing your part, right? Um, even if it means doing something you don't like, right? So that self-sacrificing impulse, that's, that's bad. All these things are bad and do not do that because they're bad, right? I don't know that that's the domain of, of spirituality, but it certainly seems to be um, the adopted um, posture of so many of these teachers. And you could argue, well, they don't know. I mean, we've been in the health wellness medical field for a long time. We, we know a little something about you know, how it is that you could be lied to, how it is that you could feel confused about what the body is doing, why it is that you would go to war with yourself. They just don't know because they've been so focused on this separate spirit and, and not seeing how it's connected to the body's messages. Okay, but then why the virtue signaling, right? Like why the recruitment of the energy of judgment and blame maybe even on the part of their followers and, and you know, uh, devotees um, in service of marginalizing, you know, those who are not complying, you can only understand it through the ways in which people who have not done the shadow work, who have not explored what it is to sit with so-called negative feelings and embrace their message, um, 
how they can be very useful tools uh, to the seemingly secular, you know, wing of things because they sit between, you know, those who are, um, you know, governmental, um, governmentally obedient and those of us who are defiant. Um, they sit between saying, well, yes, of course, the body is wise. And of course, you know, everything has meaning. Um, and, you know, we're all connected and it's all beautiful how it is. Um, and wear your mask, get your vaccine, or you can't come to my event, right? <laughs> it's so incoherent. And, you know, the, the good news is that that incoherence can be felt. We're in the age of authenticity and, and the most powerful currency I think that's trafficking between humans these days is that that feeling of authenticity. Like, are you really what you say you are? Are you lying to yourself? And of course, we are all lying to ourselves to some extent, but you'll begin to resonate with people who are lying to the same extent as you are to yourself. Right. And so you'll you'll feel kind of like, a, I don't know, like. I had an experience recently where I saw somebody talking about relationships and some kind of like, you know, um, social media pundit or whatever. And I felt so manipulated by the way that she expressed herself um, and this, this seemingly like full vulnerability that was exhibited and like crying, talking about like unnecessary details of her sexual abuse history to make the point that she was making. I felt used. But I don't think everybody in the audience felt that way, right? So there, that is just sort of like, oh, this doesn't work for me, right? So that feeling in, that you described in your body bear as like the yes or the no, your body becomes this, this channel for, for it, it, it becomes your compass, right? Like, it's just a little like, hmm, no, hmm, yes. You know, it's just a little sort of um, move this way, move that way. And then the, the real challenge is discerning when the resistance is when the sort of seeming no is a layer on top of a yes. And that happens because, you know, you can, I think, tell because it'll have a charge, right? Like when your no is your body's no guiding you away from something, it's very kind of like, like steady. It's like a good father in there. Like, no, so it's setting that boundary, right? It's not like, no, fuck him. I can't believe that. No, it's not like that. It doesn't have that charge of judgment and blame and like, you know, finger pointing um, or even like, no, I'm not doing this. This is terrible. I don't have to do this. You know, like I felt with those exercises I was alluding to before. Of course, I felt a no, I don't want to do that. My ego was like on fire and terrified, but beneath it was the, the calm, cool yes right? Which you could argue is like the inner mother, like nurturing you into growth. Um, those layers on top become more apparent because you'll feel those old trauma responses and you'll say, okay, that's not my intuition there. That's a layer on top yeah. that is trying to keep me in my small identity. Yeah. We're, we're capacitors uh, purely and things either resonate in one way or the other. And, and again, it's just experience uh, teaches discernment as far as uh, what kind of resonance is uh, right on or not. I think a lot of the, the whole spiritual practice too in the Western world is taken out of context. Mm. And that's the root of a lot of our problems. We're all trying to be spiritual and pious and, and otherworldly. But, uh, you know, I had a, a teacher a long time ago when I was in the islands, um, when I was uh, in the martial arts and he was from the old country and he was like the real deal from, you know, old lineages. And uh, this happened to be some internal arts and we're doing Tai Chi and he's just very adamant. He says, you know, if you aren't fighting, you're not doing Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were in there, you know, getting bloody noses and facing our fears and and, you know, really putting our, uh, testing our metal in all sorts of ways. And it really does bring up everything. And you have to do those, you know, those practices within that context. Whereas that's very different when I drive by the park somewhere in the city and seeing everybody just doing the Tai Chi dance, which is great. It's great exercise. And I'm not putting that down at all. 
But, um, you know, it's really not the way that practice was intended to be. And I think that's just a Western adaptation, which uh, describes everything that you're talking about here. I wrote in a, in a blog I wrote recently about this subject, I wrote about how, you know, your like good vibes yoga class can just mm -hmm. be reduced to like emotionally avoidant calisthenics, <laughs> you know, like, uh, what yeah. is that yeah. really? <laughs> That's great. Well, and the other thing I think we're realizing here is no sacred cows, right? Mm -hmm. That they've uh, definitely, un uh, we've seen that a lot with like Abraham Hicks, even who I used to love listening to, you know, supposedly touching with the Palladians or whatever. And it's like looking up to this grander consciousness. You got to get your vax. It's like, what is going on here with this? So no sacred cows. Um, the guru mentality, the guru connection, um, I think has really come to light here as the, the fraud that it is. It's commercialization, it's, it's co collectivism, it's scientism. Uh, and uh, I think uh, people are going boldly into their own uh, adventures, their own exploration into their consciousness. And we're seeing that everywhere. And I think that's exciting. And that has to do with, I think it was Charles Eisenstein, or was it Charles or... It was a Gilia Didia recently said we were going into the decentralization of spirituality. Mm. <clears throat> and, and that is really exciting to me because people get to find out themselves. And, and I do think we're still like, I know I personally am still in the five stages of grief of awakening. And I think maybe we're always in it. And I think I'm still a lot in the bargaining side of that, of those stages of grief. Cause I'm constantly bargaining, uh, you know, with like, well, like this whole trucker convoy thing. I went on a rant a couple weeks ago about it and I do enjoy the energetics of it, but I also believe that's deep in this bargaining, uh, uh, you know, aspect of the grief of awakening where they're still being the debtor, um, asking the government, uh, to remove the mandate instead of probably better would be to start trucking again, but maybe going to local farms and delivering that food to co-ops and getting proactive instead of just sitting on your ass asking. So I think a lot of us are still in that bargaining stage of grief. And I think it's also, absolutely. It's also a very personal, you know, sort of metric. Uh, how involved in the virtual reality is right, is right for you to be, right? So I'm, I'm somebody who spent many years as an activist more in the virtual reality relating to the anonymous victim in ways than my, the anonymous child, let's say I was trying to save from vaccination, you know, than my own kids. And that field is something that at least in the past year, I have felt the need to withdraw from as I focus on my lived experience of, you know, self-betrayal and the ways in which I am living out of um, allegiance to my now known needs, right? So like, for example, one of the things that um, I've been, like I've been in a practice of like saying yes to whatever creative impulses I have, right? Like I'm not a singer. I had an impulse to like record a little like song um, or I may, I've been making a lot of like videos and doing like a little dance choreography or maybe I'll make memes or I'll write an essay or whatever, record a video on, you know, some topic I've never spoken about. And there is a reclamation of these parts of me that I've never publicly demonstrated, um, especially more like sensual, sexual embodied parts. And there is a, a inner critic that's very loud that says, Kelly, you are running yourself into the oblivion of irrelevance. And now, because you don't know what's happening in the world and you're not a source of that news, you, nobody cares about you. And more than that, they judge you. And they're saying like, you're having some kind of a tantrum midlife crisis and how, you know, how dare you like abandon the posts that you have, which is to help people know what's happening in the world and whatever. It's just this whole um, inner parts war that for me, the emancipation lies in really saying like, thank you so much inner part for trying to protect me from the rejection of society um, when I am not useful to them, right? But I have this other part of me that just wants to express and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give her you know, the mic for a little while and it's gonna be okay. <laughs> so like for me, honestly, I wanna know-ish what's going on 
But for me to distract myself with even imagining that I know what that convoy was about, and you know, Mike, that I tend towards the, the arch conspiracy theorist, like everything's a psyop kind of, you know, wing of things, but that I would <laughs> concern myself with imagining that I know, or what it should have been, or could have been, or what would be the solution, or I don't know. And honestly, I kind of don't care. I care about who I know, who is suffering. I care about my own suffering. I care about my kids, right? But I think we get into very dangerous territory when we concern ourselves with, with stories, with people, with movements that we do not have intimate, real life flesh contact with. That's part of it. That's part of how they, they grab us and, and put us in the movie theater and that we don't recognize that we're watching a damn movie. Right. And we don't get up and we don't leave and we don't opt for a different movie. So I don't know. I, I know a lot of folks who otherwise were very concerned with activism out in the world who are really taking a good hard look at their personal lives and the ways in which they're not in um, integrity and the ways in which they're acting out of alignment and the ways in which they're, you know, enduring pain in their real life that's just being mirrored on the world stage. To my mind, this is where we have control. Clean your house. Make sure that every single hotspot in your life is addressed with compassion and love and courage. That's where your courage lies. It's not in your campaign for legislation change. It's not in your mobilizing you know, some big protest. This is my biased perspective, okay? I want everybody to do what's right for them, but it's possible that it's not in that place if your house is a mess. And I know a lot of folks like that, and I'm sure you do too, you know, where you can just, when I first got into vaccine activism, it was scary, the anger and the, the pain and the backstabbing and the vitriol and the camps of division. And I was like, these people have a lot of dark shit going on. How are they in any position to help anyone? And, and that's what is being asked of us. It's like, you're just going to keep feeding the beast and, you know, becoming, as Nietzsche said, the monster you're fighting. And you're going to live in that reality tube of hell, right? Until <laughs> you recognize that it starts with your, your own mandala, right? And, and really making sure that all the parts are colored in beautifully before you try to contribute um, your little, you know, portion to the collective. Yeah, I, I think what you're describing is a process of transmutation. You know, a uh, number of years back, I took myself out of hands-on practice because I felt like I was just caught in that dichotomy of conventional versus holistic. And, uh, you know, I believe we're really smack dab in the middle of the age of transmutation, which means the awareness that there's only one thing and that our job is to learn how to transmute that thing into all of the experience and, uh, you know, body parts and everything that uh, serve us or that we want to experience. So, um, yeah, I just got tired of the back and forth and all the, the holistic schools have been co-opted anyway. So, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it looks like, uh, just about every argument out there, um, you know, I just don't want any part of it anymore. That's why we've moved into even distancing ourselves from germ theory versus bioterrain because it's like this or that. And it's like, well, why don't we talk about, you know, real medicine, which is each one of us learning how to transmute the one thing into exactly what we want in the first place. And we get to experience everything along the way, just like you're describing today. Any, uh, I, I know you've got um, a sketch here. So any final thoughts and things that you'd like to comment on? Mm. Well, I was just thinking about this kind of double, as you were speaking, like this kind of double-edged sword of like community. And, you know, because <laughs> it's, it's a lot of my friends know that if I'm ever in a, a pickle with my body, right. And I get like tempted into fear, which hasn't happened in some time. However, um, I always say like, Bear, you're the person that I would ask for help. Like literally you are the person that I would ask for help. Like, and so either there's some like hypocrisy in that where I'm like keeping you as a secret doctor in my pocket who knows better about my body than I do. Or it's just this idea that's almost calming to me to know that there's such a like mind who has more experience and who can support me in my own inquiry. 
Right. And so like, that's, you're not supposed to, it's like the paradox. Yeah. You're doing it alone and you're not supposed to do it alone. Right. It's like, how can we take full responsibility, you know, for our experience, um, recognize that we are the only ones who can interpret the language of our bodies, interpret the language of our adversity, right? When, when shit goes down in your life, you're literally the only one who's ever going to understand why it's occurring. And I do believe there's a why. Um, and I don't even know where I'd be if I did not have, you know, a sisterhood to support me in my worldview, right? My girlfriends believe what I believe spiritually. They believe that everything has a meaning and that I also really need a space for that pain and hurt to be expressed, right? Like they know how to hold me in both like that wink, like, yeah, you can vent your victim story, but we, we both know this is something you created and something you actually want to have happen. And that's why it's happening. And, and now you're ready to move on. Right. So, so community, I think the shadow of it is being expressed now because we can project onto community and imagine that it has this power that it really doesn't have without our own like Shakti being donated to it. Right. Um, and then of course we can experience, you know, this betrayal and this like sense of like, Oh my God, I can't believe, um, you know, what's happening out there. And there's also, it's essential, right? And that's obviously why you all have your, you know, um, community growing the way you do is because we, we require um, that support. So just, it's just sort of like feeling into that paradox, you know, that it's not this like mercenary, you know, go out and do it on your own, figure it out. Nobody's coming for you, you know, kind of, um, impulse. That's just going to put our nervous system into fight or flight in perpetuity. Um, and it's also not the case that any longer you can outsource what is yours to tend to. Yep. The lone wolf will not make it. Yeah. So that's the dichotomy. And so uh, here we um, we stress living, like I just said in the chat, live a moral life, mm. you know, live as morally as you can and day to day and every moment and every thought, because we know thought creates our reality and like will attract like. And we are attracting those people here as we have a great community thing happening this weekend with the Whitewater Festival. We've got a bunch of Alpha Vedic people come out to see me DJ Saturday night. And what are we going to do? We are going to engage in creative dance and creative um, artistic flow and, and get into our bodies and just enjoy each other's presence and stop thinking so damn much. And... Um, I think that's really important, Kelly, like as you're twerking on Telegram here, um, <laughs> uh, right? Get have, I, have I missed out on something here? What's going on? You got some videos to catch up on there, okay? <laughs> Saturday night viewing for you and Jeff. Okay. No, but I mean, it's it's interesting. I, I'm like, the, what is like, not to like open up this whole thing, but like the moral, like to live a moral life for me, um, I, I think I would define that. Like I was just saying to my girlfriend earlier, like whenever you feel that, that little disturbance inside, right? Like it's that little whisper, that thing you wish you didn't know. And it's so personal, right? It is not the case that everybody needs to get off their iPhone because it's bad. It is the case. However, if you feel out of coherence, out of integrity within yourself, that you will not experience the expansion that would otherwise be available to you once you take the courageous action towards letting go of that thing. Like Amazon, right? Like, you know, I always like John Bush is somebody who, who had jokes about how he orders on Amazon. He doesn't seem very disturbed by it and it kind of works for him, whatever. It's like- He also drives a Tesla. <laughs> and listen, whatever works for you, however- I'm not judging, John. I'm right. not judging it. <laughs> Right. If it secretly yeah. doesn't work, like buying on Amazon, I do it most days. It not so secretly, but initially it was secretly. It, it doesn't work for me inside because I feel that disturbance, that conflict of like, shit, I can do better for myself. And I just don't want to, right. Cause it's inconvenient and all the things. And then you find yourself rationalizing. Like, so that moral compass is the same thing bear. And I were talking about, which is that, that inner feeling of, yes, 
or no? Are you in allegiance to that or are you in conflict with it? You know, recruiting your defenses to rationalize why it's okay to live in conflict with it. And, and that integration is a, that's quite a, you know, it's quite a tall order. We can only do what we know how to do. Yep. Yep. That's beautiful, Kelly. Thanks so much for, for being with us today. And uh, I really look forward to seeing you in person again. We had so much fun in Austin. So I really, I really consider you, you to be family here in the Alpha Absolutely. Beta crew. And you always have a place here. We have a, a beautiful guest house right on the river. As you know, please bring your daughters out, come hang out. Um, Deb is the mother hen here. She is amazing and would love to have you guys here. So um, I know we don't have that beautiful tropical weather, but the summer is pretty amazing here. It's, it's, it's glorious here. So anyways, you're always welcome. And um, we got to get down to South Southern uh, Florida one of these days too, because I know it's a lot yep. of fun there. What's the music really? and sky update? So music yeah, and yeah, sky, music and sky. That. We are going back to the desert. Um, we are going to be uh, aiming at now fall equinox um and it will be uh a glorious event uh kelly i want you there please uh we were are going to officially announce very soon but yeah it'll be more in the socal region actually they're kind of close to our uh ventura uh location down there so oh it's um, out there um, okay it's so at there. least yeah. if you if you do come, Kelly, you'll at least be on the West Coast. You'll still be away uh, from us uh, further north. But, uh, you know, if you've come that far, you have to come see the rest of uh, California there and get up to the Oregon border. Uh, a warning, no, uh, we might put you to work up here while you're here. <laughs> I'll take care of the chickens. I'm good at that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome guys well hey i hope you enjoyed this uh, conversation as much as we did uh please give us a thumbs up a share uh, set, uh share this with your friends and family it really helps us get this information out uh and if you're new to alpha vedic join us on telegram t.me forward slash alpha vedic or we're on discord alphavedic.com forward slash discord we're on patreon and we're getting off patreon yay Thanks to Grant, he's working really hard. We are getting more sovereign. Everything's gonna be on alphavedic.com on our own server. And we are basically mimicking that functionality of, of Patreon on our own site. So that is weeks away. Uh, please support us there though right now. And anything else, any final words, Kelly, where can they find you? You have this vital mind, this vital life. I'm sorry, you. I know you, it's like people put my book title. They're like, own your vital mind when you read <laughs> it. It's so funny. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I, it's so funny. I, I'm starting to get creepy feeling about Telegram. Are you getting that at all? Like, I don't know. I always but, have. I always have. I so. know, I know, I know. We know that, you know, that he's in bed with the World Economic Forum, but I'm just starting to get that feeling like, oh, damn, like. The well, we're on QChat too, on Cordal. So we have our own group, Alphabetic okay. group on QChat. Um, that is where everything will be going. That is completely encrypted, completely sovereign. You literally have your own node you're running in your house that has all of your data. You can get one of these bad boys. We talked about it at uh, the Greater Reset. Um, and that's where we're going. So eventually we will be off Telegram too. Thank God it's we'll be our like for people we'll like be our us. very own secret society. I like exactly right. We'll do it our way. Yeah. So no, but that's why my website is really the, the only place to consistently find me. Uh, because who knows? And uh, we have uh folks in the alphabetic community that are also in your community and they just can't help can't stop raving about it. So keep doing what you're doing, Kelly. You're really uh, affecting the field in amazing ways. And that's in the end what community is all about, right? Us having our little sovereign bubbles connect yes. and then spread out um, and uh, really change the world. So you're doing it in your own magical way. And we appreciate you and thank God you're out there. Oh, I love you too. And I'm just so, so blessed and such evidence, right? Like how could this be a bad thing? Simply a bad thing. If it brought folks like you into my field, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you, Kill. I love you a lot and hope to see you soon. Yes. Thanks guys. We'll see you next Thursday. Get outside, get your feet, uh, 
grounded to the soil, go uh, start prepping your beds for the spring, uh, grow your own food, go on hikes, get out in nature. She truly is the best teacher. She's here for us and she loves you. And just always remember that. Love you and we'll see you next week. Cheers.